Welcome to Behind the Smile with Ash Butters, a podcast designed to reveal the truth behind the masks we wear. Together, we look to demystify the human mind and its behaviours in relation to mental health, trauma and addiction. My name's Ash and I'll be your host as we uncover the real stories of people's pain and the steps they've taken to live a life of freedom in recovery. From sobriety to spirituality, join me each week as we uncover the reasons why people seek recovery and how their lives have changed by living one day at a time. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Behind the Smile. If you're tuning in today and it's the day that the episode has just dropped, then the first thing I want to do is to wish you a very Merry Christmas. If you're listening today, then that means it's the 25th of December, which is not only Christmas Day, but it's also my birthday, my belly button birthday, and I am 36 years old today. It sounds kind of crazy to say that out loud because... I certainly don't feel 36. Not that I really know what 36 is meant to feel like, but I definitely feel as though I don't feel the age that I am biologically, if that makes sense. Now, that's certainly not a bad thing. I guess you can think about things that have influenced that, you know, COVID, for instance. I think we all feel like we lost a few years there in the pandemic. And then the mere fact that I lived a large portion of my life in addiction means that I feel like in many ways, I sort of just started again at the age of 32, which technically means I'm kind of four years old in some ways. So it's wonderful to celebrate another year Earthside. It's wonderful to be 36 years old and to be in the best place I've ever been in my life, mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And I really wanted to celebrate with you guys today. I wanted to give something back, a gift to you from me on my birthday. And I thought, why not share with you all 36 life lessons that I've learned over the last 36 years? So that's what we're diving into today in this solo episode. I hope you guys enjoy. So let's kick it off with lesson number one. You've got to feel it to heal it. Now, this has become a bit of a mantra for me over the years, and if you've ever had the opportunity to work with me either one-on-one or in a group container, you'll hear me say this a lot. Essentially, what I'm talking about here is the idea that our emotions are energy in motion. What that means is to be able to process any given emotion, whether that's a positive emotion or maybe an emotion that creates pain or discomfort or sadness, no matter what the emotion is, we have to be able to let it move through our body to be able to process and actually heal or learn from that given experience and that emotion. Now, when we don't allow that process to occur because we're searching for something to make us feel better, and that could be maybe a drink or maybe it's shopping or maybe it's food, it definitely presents differently for all of us. But what happens is when we take the thing that stops us from processing the authentic emotion and we numb with something outside of ourselves, what happens is that emotion becomes stuck in the body because we're not allowing it to actually move through. Now, over time, this can become really detrimental. What it can almost cause is this emotional constipation where we feel blocked. And then what can happen is our emotions can come out sideways. And this might present in a mental health disorder like depression or anxiety or even ADHD. Or maybe it's just that you can't control your emotions. So you find that you'll blow up at any given moment or you are prone to rage attacks. All of this is because of an inability to allow ourselves to process and feel emotions in real time. Now, I know that processing emotions can feel really uncomfortable, but trust me, when we stop running and we start leaning into this the discomfort, our bodies actually get better at being able to feel it and process it in a much smoother amount of time. So this is definitely something that I've had to learn how to do. 
I used alcohol from a really young age to numb my emotions. And if you haven't heard my story, you can go back to episode one of the podcast where I actually share my story and my timeline. But that was definitely my go-to. And for anyone else listening out here today, maybe you relate to that, or maybe like I said, it's something else. But what I've come to realize is that the emotion isn't a bad thing. And if I numb the emotion that's negative or uncomfortable, then I also numb the positive emotion or the emotion that feels good. So I'd much rather allow myself a life where I experience the full gamut of emotions. And if they are challenging, then you can use different tools to help you process them. You don't just have to sit there and white knuckle it. You know, there's incredible healing modalities like somatic healing, uh, practices such as yoga, meditation, all of these beautiful tools can help you to move through that emotion in real time. Lesson number two, this too shall pass. Now, this is another mantra of mine. It's something that I will actually say to myself out loud when I'm going through one of these periods of challenge where I feel like my emotions are almost going to kill me. But here's the thing that I've learned. They never will. There are other things that might, you know, if I if I start drinking again, if I pick up a drug, like those things that could actually kill me are not an option anymore. And knowing that a feeling can't kill me is actually really calming to me today. And if I just repeat that mantra, this too shall pass, then I know that I can get through those moments of discomfort. Lesson number three, you won't always feel good and that's okay. So like I mentioned, I discovered alcohol at the age of 12. And what that meant for me was that I stopped processing my emotions from about that age. I would always turn to a substance rather than having to lean into that emotion. But the other thing is, is that I just assumed that the goal was to always feel good. I didn't really understand that Part of the human experience is that we don't always feel good. In fact, so often we learn our biggest lessons in those moments of difficulty, in those moments of pain and challenge. So it's really important that we understand that when we're having a season that is a little bit challenging, to rather than to force it or to rush through it or to wish it away, to try and see the lesson that is being taught? What is the universe trying to show me? What is my higher power guiding me towards in this moment? And realizing that I can experience a whole range of emotions. Like it's all about this polarity, right? I can't have the good without the bad. I can't experience true joy without experiencing sadness. And I don't know what true love is without experiencing loss. So remember, each time you want to go to that thing that's outside of you to stop the feeling, to make yourself feel good, rather than just letting yourself process it, then you're stopping yourself from feeling all emotions. Lesson number four, the aim of the game is not to be happy. It's to live in contentment. Now, This was a game changer when I started to realize this. I would say for about 30 years, I thought the aim of the game on this earth was to be happy. Now, don't get me wrong. Happiness is a really wonderful emotion and, you know, it's wonderful to feel happy. I'm not discrediting that. But it's kind of like what I was saying before. It's that chasing happiness is not the end goal. Because happiness is fleeting and happiness is so often found outside of ourselves. What I've come to realize is that the feeling that I was actually chasing, that feeling that I was searching for at the end of the bottle or every time I bought a new bag or went on a holiday, what I was actually searching for was this feeling of contentment, which is like an inner serenity. It's this inner knowing that not only am I enough, but I have enough. And I remember experiencing this moment of contentment earlier in the year. I was actually just standing in the kitchen doing something really mundane. I think I was preparing dinner and I just had this wash of contentment come over me. And I realized in that moment 
Not only do I have enough, like there's nothing else that I need in my life right now, but more importantly, I am enough. And as someone who grew up with a negative core belief that was, I am not enough, being able to sit in that contentment, like that is a feeling that is completely indescribable. Lesson number five, choose faith over fear. Here's the thing. Fear is what underpins most of our discomfort. And what I've come to realize is that when something is causing me a disturbance, when I'm not feeling good in my skin, what I now try and do is I try and peel back the layers to see what the root cause is. Like what is the actual thing that's making me feel like this? Because it's never really the thing that I think it is. It's not actually what that person said or did. When you peel back the layers and you go deep within, you'll often find more than not that it's fear that's driving this emotion. And generally, it is either a fear that you'll lose something or it's a fear that you won't get what you want. Now, when I'm running spiritually fit and I'm deeply connected to my faith and my higher power, then that fear isn't as strong because I have this faith and this belief that I'm moving in a state of flow in life and that everything is happening for a reason. You know, I was actually just chatting to a friend of mine about this the other day. She's in a relationship at the moment and she's had a bit of fear come up around infidelity. And I can absolutely relate to this. This is something that has come up for me in a lot of my relationships. And I understand now that it's actually really got nothing to do with the partner. It's actually my insecurity and my fear of abandonment that is driving this emotion. And so I was sharing my own experience. And then I also shared this idea of faith over fear. And at the end of the day, this is the thing, right? Worst case scenario, that person is unfaithful and that relationship ends. To be able to trust that you have something or someone or a greater power than you looking after you. If you're truly connected to that faith and if you're spiritually fit, then you can trust that it has happened for a reason. Perhaps that person has been moved out of your world so that another person can be brought in. Now, it's something that I am still perfecting, trust me. Uh, I certainly don't get this right all the time. But when I can choose faith over fear, I'm again, I'm allowed to I'm able to live in that place of contentment and peace rather than, you know, panic and and distrust and all those other horrible feelings that, that come with that emotion. Lesson number six, your relationships are a direct reflection of the amount of energy you put into them. So you've probably heard this saying before, actions speak louder than words. And this is something that I truly believe is reflected in our relationships, whether that be your intimate relationships, maybe your family, or even your friends. Now, as I've gotten older, I have noticed that spending quality time with my girlfriends has become a lot more challenging because everybody's lives get really busy. Out of my core friendship circle, I'm actually the only one that doesn't have children. Most of my girlfriends have three children each, which is crazy to think about. But it also means that our lives are really busy. And I'm also not saying that my life isn't busy because I don't have children. In fact, my life is also really, really busy. And so what I've realized is that if we don't make the time to spend quality time together, those relationships can start to drift. And it's not because you don't care about the person. It's not that you don't love them or respect them. But, you you know, these relationships, the ones that you want to nurture and foster, like they actually require action. They actually require time and commitment for you to nurture them. And I can tell you without fail, the relationships in my life where I take the action to show up and invest, those are the relationships that are the most authentic and they're the ones that I feel the most energetically drawn to. I was really lucky. In fact, a couple of weeks ago, we actually all went to Noosa together. This is my core group of girlfriends who we all went to school together. So we've been friends for over 25 years now. And like I said, our lives are all really, really busy. There's lots of babies. 
But we made the effort. We made the effort to carve out three nights to go away to Queensland and spend time together. And I honestly can't tell you how much it just filled my soul with joy to spend that time, that uninterrupted time, to have those beautiful conversations that happen just when you're, you know, passing each other by, or maybe you're going for a walk to grab a coffee. Because I so often find that when you go out to these dinners, whether they're monthly or bi-monthly or however you catch up with your friends, I often find that they can be really hard to form deep connections in because generally there's, there's a few of you there. So say there's five or six people there. And to try and get everyone to have time to be able to share, it stays really surface level. I mean, that's just my experience. And so having those three days of time that was completely uninterrupted, it meant that we could go deep. It meant that we could have conversations that just don't have the space. You know, they need time to create the space and the energy. And, you know, you just can't do that in a two hour dinner. So I'm super grateful that I had that time. It really renewed my passion for my friends, if that makes sense. And um, yeah, I'm super grateful that they made the time to show up as well. One of my girlfriends was there with a seven week old baby. Like I couldn't believe it. You know, she just, she's incredible. Jackie, you are amazing. But to everyone that showed up, like it just, it meant the world and it's, me- it's memories as well. Like the, you know, none of us have tomorrow guaranteed. And if you can take the time to make these memories, they are the things that last. So that brings me to lesson number seven, quality over quantity. So again, this is all about friendships for me. And something I've had to learn is that it's not about how many friends you have. In fact, the older I get, the smaller my group of friends has become. And I see that as a good thing. It's not something to resist or something to fear. In fact, I love it because it means that I can invest more of my time into these people because I'm not spreading myself so thin. So what I have now is probably less friends. I could probably count my close friends on two hands, but they get more of me. They get the best of me and they get the real me, which is so important. Staying on the theme of relationships, but moving into more intimate relationships, I want to talk to you now about Lesson number eight, a healthy relationship is one where your nervous system is regulated. Now, this was a big one for me. Being that I identify as a love addict, which is somebody who has grown up with abandonment in their life. So their primary caregiver wasn't able to give them the nurturing that they required and therefore they feel abandoned, they generally become a love addict. On the other hand, somebody who has grown up with an enmeshed relationship with their primary caregiver, say their mother or their father, then they tend to be love avoidance when they grow up and start to form intimate relationships. Actually, if you want to know more about love addiction, which is such a fascinating topic, you can check out episode 28 of the podcast where I interview psychotherapist Diane Young. So go check that out. So as I mentioned, I identify as a love addict and it's something that I have worked on in years of therapy. And it's something that I'm aware of now, but I would still say that's more, if I had to pick a side, that's where I would lean towards because I had abandonment from my father. He wasn't around a lot as I was growing up. And then my parents separated and divorced and dad left the home. So there was that abandonment wound created there. And so what that meant was when I started forming intimate relationships, I was always attracted to avoidance. So I would fall in love really fast, really quickly. And the avoidant generally leans in at the beginning and almost like lures the love addict in through this wall of seduction. But then what happens is once the love addict is all in, the avoidant pulls back and starts to turn away and actually starts to create intensity outside the relationship. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they are unfaithful, although that absolutely can be one way of creating intensity outside the relationship, but it could also be um, work. Like they could start spending a lot more time at work, going in early, staying late, 
Or it might be that they're spending a lot more time with their friends, you know, hanging out with the boys or hanging out with the girls a lot more than they did previously. And this causes the love addict, which is me, a lot of pain because then you start thinking, well, what's wrong with me? What have I done wrong? You know, do I need to lose weight? Do I need to cook more dinners? Do I need to organize that holiday with these mates? You know, we go through all of these crazy thoughts in our heads, trying to change ourselves when in the reality, it's it's actually got nothing to do with us. It's the avoidant that has turned away. Now, what does this cause? This cause a highly dysregulated nervous system. And that has been my experience for every relationship that I have been in until I met my current partner. So I've been in a relationship with my current partner now. We met in April 2022. So, you know, coming up to two years now. And honestly, this is the first time that I've actually understood what it means to be in a healthy relationship. I actually have a regulated nervous system now. My partner, Damien, makes me feel safe and he makes me feel secure. And he doesn't do this by, you know, reassuring me. It's not about that. It's in his actions. It's in the way that he shows up in our relationship. You know, I never have to question him or worry about what he's telling me because he is honest to a fault. And there's just no games. Like I never realized that I was addicted to the chase. In the beginning of our relationship, because there were no games, I actually wasn't even sure if there was a spark. Like I I knew I really liked him, but my head was almost telling me that because I wasn't feeling the things that I thought I was meant to feel, which was actually just dysfunctional attachment style, because I wasn't feeling that, I was almost telling myself that it wasn't the right, he wasn't my person. But I'm so grateful because I have a therapist and because I have a mentor who I speak to and they know my stuff and they can see my old habits and behaviors. They were able to guide me, to support me to stay. And I'm so, so grateful to those two women who guided me through that season of my life because it's allowed me to, like I said, experience the healthiest relationship I've ever been in in my life. Lesson number nine, codependency wears a cape. So what do I mean by this? Well, for those listening along, I don't know about you, but I used to think that codependency just meant somebody who was really needy or really attached to their partner. And that is certainly one way that codependency can show up. But I've realized over time and through doing the work that Codependency can actually show up in a lot of other ways. And one way that I know I am being codependent is when I am seeking external validation from my partner. Or another way that codependency wears a cape for me is when I am personally affected by my partner's mood. So I don't know if you guys will be following along here, but let me give you an example. So say you are, you're just getting on with your day, doing your thing, and your partner comes home and they're in a really bad mood. So something's happened to them, which clearly has nothing to do with you because it's, you know, happened while they've been out of the house, but they come home, they're in that mood, they bring that energy into the house and you make it mean that you've done something wrong. (laughs) It sounds crazy saying it out loud, I know, but that's what I have done for so many years. I would get personally affected by the shitty mood that my partner was in. And I would think that, you know, again, like I wasn't good enough or that they were mad at me, or I would just be like, I would, my emotions and my feelings would get hurt. And something that I've actually learned how to do by mirroring my partner, because he is so good at doing this is when I'm having a moment, (laughs) an emotional meltdown or just a shit day, he doesn't take it personally. Like he doesn't make it mean anything other than Ash is having a shit day. And then rather than him getting shitty back at me, he's, he holds space. Like he checks in, he's, he asks if there's anything that he can do to support me. And sometimes I'll say no, because I'll just need space. Sometimes I'll just need a hug. And so these days I can actually ask for it, which is amazing rather than shutting down. 
and we're able to communicate and work our way through it. And what he doesn't do is force me to snap out of the mood, right? He lets me experience the feeling. He lets me process the healing. And again, it's just this beautiful, supportive way of being in partnership, which is something that I had never experienced before. And it's allowed me to be a lot less codependent. Lesson number 10, removing the armor is essential to personal growth. So this is something that I work with when I am guiding my clients through their transformation processes is we always start with this first pillar of removing armor because here's the thing. Throughout life, we all experience trauma, whether that's big T trauma, so things like sexual assaults, war, all of those really big experiences, big life experiences that we hear of, see of, perhaps have experienced ourselves. But then we also have little t trauma, which Dr. Gabor Mate talks about beautifully, where he describes little t trauma as being just as damaging to our psyche and the way that we then form into adulthood as big t trauma. But the problem is society still doesn't recognize it to be so. So we minimize and we discredit. So I'll give you an example of some small t traumas. Maybe you were bullied a lot when you were in primary school. Maybe your teacher told you that you were stupid when you put your hand up and got the question wrong. Or maybe, like me, you had a primary caregiver who wasn't available, who wasn't able to nurture you and meet your needs as a child. So what we do when we experience these traumas is we start to put on invisible armor. It's a way of protecting ourselves because we don't want to continue getting hurt, right? So we put on this invisible armor, but the problem is as we start to grow into adults, unless you do the work, unless you do the healing, get a therapist, do body work, whatever it is for you. If you don't do that, then you're not actually taught how to remove the armor. And then you become a person moving through this world who's wearing this heavy, heavy armor. Like I want you to visualize this for a moment. Imagine medieval times and you've got the, the full body suit. You've got the breastplate on, you've got the helmet on, you've got the chain metal on. So life is exhausting because you're being weighed down. But not only that, what's even more detrimental is that when you're wearing this armor, you won't let people get in and you can't connect to yourself because you're blocking yourself from your own heart. So before you can do any kind of inner work, the first step is being willing to remove this armor. Lesson number 11, I'm not responsible for my first thought, but I am responsible for my second. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with this thing I like to call the itty bitty shitty committee that lived inside my head. And this committee would tell me some pretty average things. Uh, it would tell me all sorts of things like I wasn't good enough, that I was unworthy, that I was unlovable that I needed to lose weight, that nobody liked me. These were the kinds of things that my head would tell me. Now, the problem is, is that if you're experiencing this, you'll understand that these voices are really convincing because they come from your own voice and they're inside your head. So they can be really, really loud. The thing is, often these thoughts they're created by negative wiring. And until we actually stop and question the conditioned thought, we will continue to have these automatic thought patterns run through our head. But when you can actually stop and pause and question the conditioned thought, you start to understand that a lot of the time your head is lying to you. So what I like to do now when I have one of these negative thought patterns start to arise I, I question the conditioned thought and I try and fact check it. And I actually look for evidence to substantiate whether or not this thing that I'm telling myself is actually true. And I'll tell you what, nine times out of 10, it's not even true. 
But if I'm just working on autopilot and I'm not stopping to actually question the thought, then I start to believe it. And that's when you can start to get in the trap of these really horrible negative thought patterns. So by just pressing stop and questioning that conditioned thought, I get to start rewiring my neural pathways. Remember that our our brains are reptilian. Our brains were created back in the day when all we really needed to think about was survival, food, and procreation. We deal with so much more in the world today. So my brain is going to be in survival mode at all times. And again, it will give me ideas or thoughts based off old experiences, which may not even be relevant to my current day reality. And if my brain is in survival mode 24-7, then it might even be getting in the way of my healing. So by stepping into your own power and actually questioning the conditioned thought and having ownership over that, again, you can start to heal by rewiring these neural pathways and creating more positive thought patterns. Lesson number 12, the most powerful act of self-care is meditation. Now, I am a huge fan of meditation. If you didn't know that, if you haven't listened to the podcast before, you can head to my website, ashbutters.com and actually grab yourself some free guided meditations. Meditation for me has been an absolute game changer and it is truly the greatest act of self-care and it's something that I try and do every single day. If you imagine that your mind is like an ocean, On a dark, stormy day, the waves are crashing and it's actually just impossible to see the bottom of the ocean because of the the waves crashing, right? There's the water and the bubbles and everything and you can't see the bottom, you can't see clearly. Well, our mind is exactly the same. When you have a lot of busy thoughts and overactive mind spinning around up in there, what it means is that you can't actually see your thoughts clearly. What meditation enables you to do is to start to practice the pause to find that stillness and that space within the mind so that you can actually see your thoughts clearly. Lesson 13, practicing the pause. Now, the pause is this magical moment in between a reaction and a response. It allows me to tap into this consciousness and make decisions from a place of embodiment rather than reactivity. I used to live from a place of constant reactivity. I was almost like in a state of fight or flight all the time. And I was really defensive. And remember, I had this highly dysregulated nervous system. What practicing the pause has allowed me to do is to create that space in my pattern of thinking so that I'm no longer automatic and I'm no longer reactive. And when I use this tool in my daily life, it actually allows me to live from a place of peace rather than from a place of anxiety. Now, I certainly don't get this right 100% of the time. Trust me, I am no saint. But when I do try and practice this, It not only improves my life, but also my relationships and everyone around me. Lesson 14, honesty in all areas of life. Now, this idea of rigorous honesty was something that I was taught really early on in the days that I was getting sober. I was told that I had to be willing and honest in all areas of my life. Now, as somebody who had become a bit of a liar throughout those last years of my addiction, I was hiding my drinking and also I was quite manipulative because I was always trying to work my life in a way that suited me. I was, yeah, I was inherently dishonest and dishonesty can be a really slippery slope. It's this whole idea, right, that if you think a white lie isn't a big deal, but you constantly tell white lies, then what you're actually doing is believing your own bullshit. And that's a really dangerous place for somebody in recovery to be. Because if I'm believing my own white lies, then what if one day my head tells me that having a drink is a good idea? 
Like that's an absolute lie. But if I'm used to believing my own lies, then maybe I'll think that's true. And then it'll be a much faster slope of rationalizing and justifying until I end up picking up a drink. So that's one reason that rigorous honesty is so important in my life. But the other reason is, is that being dishonest actually just doesn't feel good, especially when you've been living a life where you show up each day being honest, when you get used to this. I find that if I have told a white lie for whatever reason, like I actually really feel it in the pit of my stomach. It's horrible. And it almost reminds me of those mornings waking up with guilt, shame, and remorse where I'd pick up my phone and I'd like my stomach would drop because I'd look at my call log and, you know, there'd been a 45 minute conversation with somebody and I couldn't remember any of it. Or I'd seen text messages that I'd sent out. Ugh, oh, that feeling. Oh my goodness. I'm so, no, thank you. Well, that's the kind of feeling I get these days if I realize that I've been dishonest. So it's just not an option anymore. And, you know, you'll hear me bang on about honesty all the time. I say it's a value. Some people argue that it's not. But for me, it's just the way I want to live my life today. Lesson number 15, progress, not perfection. This is another one of my favorite sayings in recovery. As a recovering perfectionist, this one really hits home. What it means to me today is that I don't have to do things perfectly. I just have to continue to show up each day and try my best. I'm not always going to do it perfectly and that's okay. But if my intentions are good and I'm showing up honestly, then I'll continue moving through my life in the direction that I want to go. Lesson 16, there's freedom in letting go. So this one for me is all about the idea of non-attachment. Now, I first learned about non-attachment when I was doing my 200-hour yoga teach training. Non-attachment is referred to as a parigraha in the yamas and niyamas of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. And it's this whole idea that when you move through life holding on to things, so whether that be that you're trying to control an outcome or you're really attached to particular possessions or even particular relationships. What that means is you're not able to live in a state of flow. Like there's this, this, it's hard to describe. It's almost like this, you feel stuck because you're not allowing life, which is impermanent, to actually just be what it needs to be. You're trying to control the outcome. And essentially that means that you'll be living in a state of fear. So what I've come to do, what I've really tried to embody and what I try to practice is this idea of non-attachment. And it's amazing the shifts that I've seen over the last few years in particular. Like I really don't have a care for designer things anymore. Like I used to love getting a new handbag or new shoes and don't get me wrong. Like I still really like those things. And I don't think that you have to, I'm not saying that you have to, you can't have those nice things if you want to live with non-attachment. But what I find is that I'm not attached. If, If it was taken away tomorrow, I'd be okay. I think that's the main message. You know, I was even telling my sister in law the other day, I came out of my driveway and I scratched my car. And back in the day, that would have absolutely made me so angry. I would have been pissed off. I would have been in a shit mood all day because there's now a scratch down the side of my car. Honestly, when it was happening, I was driving and it was like, and I thought, oh God. And then I just paused and then I just started laughing because like at the end of the day, it's a car. And it's a scratch and there are bigger things going on in this world today. But I know that I am able to have that reaction to life because I'm living from this place of non-attachment. Lesson number 17, people pleasing is actually just approval sucking. Now, I used to think that I was the most generous person in the world because when you asked me to do something, I would always say yes. But here's the thing, deep down, maybe I didn't want to do that. And then I would actually resent you for it. So I was being dishonest. 
Like I'm saying yes and I'm showing up and I'm doing the things because I'm so desperate for you to like me. God forbid you get upset or you don't like me, but I'm abandoning myself in the process. I don't know. Can any of you guys relate to that? It really shifted for me when it was put to me that approval sucking was actually what I was doing. Like I was seeking the approval of people. It wasn't about me wanting to be helpful or really please the person. Like at the end of the day, it was about me. And I was chatting to my therapist about this recently. And again, she said, yeah, it's just like chronic dishonesty. And when it was reframed like that, it actually made it so much easier for me to be able to let go. And to, to because I don't want to have that as a character trait. That's not part of my makeup or the woman that when I stand in my integrity, I don't want to have that be a part of the way I carry myself through this life. So that reframe from people pleaser to approval sucker was definitely helpful for me. So if you are feeling like you people please all the time as well, maybe that'll be helpful for you. Lesson number 18, it's okay to say no. I wasn't really able to get comfortable with this until I practiced establishing boundaries. Again, being a chronic people pleaser, I never wanted to disappoint anyone. I didn't want anyone to be upset with me. But in the last 12 months, I've got to say, I've gotten a lot better at saying no when I don't want to do something. And here's the kicker. I don't make up an excuse. I don't lie about the reason. I actually just give an honest answer as to why. You know, a few weeks ago, this happened. I, I declined a dinner invitation because I was exhausted and my body was telling me to slow down. And the minute I said no, and I, I backed out and I got myself out of it, I felt instant relief. Like your body is always trying to communicate with you, right? And you can tell when you're about to make a decision, how you feel after that, how the body communicates to you will hopefully give you an inclination of whether or not you made the right decision. Now, obviously this is all within reason. There's absolutely times that I show up for things that I don't particularly want to show up to because they're important to those that I love. So maybe my friend is having an opening for something, or maybe my partner's got a work thing uh, that I've been invited to with a bunch of people I don't know. And, you know, that, that might feel overwhelming, but it's important to him. So I'm going to show up for those things, right? But then there's also things in life these days that I can say no to, and I can feel comfortable saying a no to because I'm no longer abandoning myself. And I find these days that I have a much stronger internal compass that guides me in making these decisions. Lesson 19, investing in your mental health should take priority. So over the last four years, I would say I've spent more money on investing in my mental health than I have in going on holidays, buying new clothes, what else? Basically anything really. I have prioritized my mental health and I, and honestly, this is the best I've ever felt. Here's the thing. When you take the time to water your internal garden, to actually nurture yourself, that has a direct impact on your mental health. And you start to tap into that beautiful sense of contentment that I was sharing before. You may also feel other beautiful emotions like joy and happiness. You might find that the more you improve your mental health, the more you improve your outlook on life. So life starts to feel easier, especially if you've you know had a season where life has felt really, really hard. Working on your mental health and showing up for yourself will start to shift those things but it requires an action. It requires a commitment. You can't just sit there wishing it away or hoping things will change, but not actually doing anything about it. And, you know, I, f I find it so frustrating when I speak to people who say, oh, I can't afford to invest in myself. You know, whether that be working with a therapist or doing a program or investing in a coach, they say, I can't afford that. But then they'll choose to go out on the weekends and spend money on a new outfit and 
alcohol and whatever else. And like, please don't get me wrong. There is absolutely no judgment here because I 100% did that for years and years and years. So I totally get it. I absolutely get it. And I'm not judging it, but it frustrates me because I, I just wish that these people understood the value in investing in themselves and realizing that if maybe you were to reprioritize just for a period of time, then what you're constantly searching for that seems to always, the diet, like it's always shifting, right? You get the thing and then that's not enough and then you need the next thing. That stops happening when you start working with your internal emotions and you start working on your mental health and watering your internal garden. Lesson 20, perception is projection. So this is related again to your mindset and your mental health. It's your perception of life that will determine the way you experience it. There's a reason why there are miserable millionaires and really joyful people living in poverty. Now, I'm not discounting that bad things happen and that you can have a difficult period in your life. I absolutely get that. Trust me, I've been there. But if you're constantly perceiving the world through a lens of lack and negativity, then that's exactly how it's going to feel, no matter how much abundance there is in reality. Lesson 21, nothing external will ever fill the internal void. When you spend your life constantly searching for things outside of yourself to fill the hole in your soul, you end up becoming disconnected from the one thing that can actually fill that void, and that's yourself. Lesson 22, happiness is an inside job. So again, I'm talking about this idea that If you're constantly searching for things outside of you to make you feel better, it will always be fleeting. It will never last for more than I'd say 24 hours. And this could be a, a new car, a job promotion. Maybe if it's a new relationship, it'll last a little bit longer than that. But that feeling that you're looking for, like it's never going to last. It has to come from within. Now, the more time that I've spent going inwards and actually finding ways to nourish myself, whether that be through meditation, therapy, journaling, or simply sitting with myself, the more often I've done this, the more I've experienced these moments of contentment, these moments of happiness and real authentic joy. I used to be so programmed to trying to find happiness outside of myself. Like each time I got the thing, it was never enough. Like then I would want the next thing. Like there's a reason why I have moved houses every two years of my life for the last 36 years. Like it's always that like seeking the thing, the next thing that's going to make you happy. But I'm getting better now at realizing that like like it is 100% my internal world, my internal conditioning that determines my overall state of being. Lesson 23, esteemable acts build self-esteem. What I'm talking about here really is being of service and showing up for others. This has been an absolute game changer for me. Now, Being in recovery, being an active member of 12-step fellowship, I have the blessing and the opportunity to do this on a regular basis. But if you're not in 12-step fellowship, if you're not in recovery, you can still absolutely do this. You can show up for people in all areas of your life. So maybe it's an example of like doing something for someone that you don't really want to do, but it's really going to help them. Like a perfect example is helping someone move house. I don't know anyone that actually wants to help somebody do that. It's (laughs) not the greatest, but we do it, right? We show up for those that we love. Or another example might be doing something for someone and not expecting any recognition. Crazy thought, hey? (laughs) Here's the thing. 
When I first got into recovery, my self-esteem was all but decimated because I had spent the best part of the last 10 years of my life constantly disappointing myself, constantly lying to myself because I told, would tell myself every single day, I'm not going to drink today. And then I'd break that promise. And so my self-esteem was shattered. But the beauty of rebuilding my life showing up for myself every day, keeping those promises and actually getting off myself to help others. Every single day, I am rebuilding and repairing my self-esteem. And when I'm helping other people, I'm not thinking about my own problems. It's a win-win. Lesson 24, moving my body is a privilege, not a punishment. This really shifted for me when I did my 200 hour yoga teacher training. So I actually first started doing yoga mm, probably back in about 2018, maybe. And again, it was a way to lose weight. It was driven by this desire to, to you know, to look a certain way. Uh, rather than actually having love and respect for my body and, and wanting to really nurture and foster that mind-body connection. You know, I, from a really young age, again, if you've listened to previous episodes, you'll know I have had disordered eating from about the age of 14. Then I was taking a lot of drugs from, you know, the age of 14, 15, I started that um, and then into my 20s. And so I did a lot of damage to my metabolism and I grew up in an era where, you know, it was just like skinny cells. And th that was really the message that was driven to me in my teenage years. And so I always had this distorted relationship with my body and the way I looked. Doing my 200 hour teacher training and really understanding and embodying the principles of yoga helped me to heal and repair my relationship with my body. So today I move my body because I, I want to be fit, but it's also because I love my body and also because of the benefits it has to my mental health. The other thing to remember is there are so many people out there who actually can't move their bodies. So the fact that I can move mine is something that I am grateful for on a daily basis. That brings me to lesson 25. A daily gratitude practice will shift your mindset. Now, I could talk about gratitude lists all day long. I am such a big fan of writing a gratitude list. There are so many benefits to writing a daily gratitude practice, one of which is this incredible improvement in our overall outlook and our overall mood. Remember what I was talking about with these neural pathways and if we've had a tendency to have negative thinking for a really long time, writing a gratitude list will actually start to help rewire these neural pathways so that you start to see the positives. Writing it consistently will help this rewiring happen faster. Remember that your thoughts create your reality. It's that whole idea of perception is projection. So remember the more you look for the positives, the more you look for abundance, the more you will feel it as well. So a couple of tips that I always like to share when it comes to writing a gratitude list. The first one is to start a WhatsApp group or a Telegram group and share it with a group of friends. This not only keeps you accountable, but it's really great because you can then see their gratitudes as well. And it can maybe remind you, oh yeah, there's that thing that I didn't think about that I also experience on a daily basis that I can be grateful for. The second thing to do is to start small. So often people think they have to be grateful for these big audacious things in life. And certainly we can be grateful for the big things, but we can also be grateful for the small things. And I find for me, that's actually where the biggest shifts occur is where I can start to see the beautiful small things in my life that I get to experience on a daily basis that I'm grateful for. And then the Final tip for writing a gratitude list is definitely to do it in the morning. I find that when I write my gratitude list in the morning, it sets me up for the day ahead and helps me have that positive outlook from the outset. Lesson 26, developing a spiritual practice will give you freedom. 
This is freedom from having to get things right. It's freedom from my own thoughts. It's freedom from the need to control. A mentor of mine often says to me that God is in everything. And I absolutely love this because it really helps me to see the lessons, even in the hard times, even in the difficult seasons, I now look to what am I learning? What is my higher power, my God trying to show me in this moment? And again, like it's just such a beautiful way to be able to let go of the need to control my life and actually step into the flow. And when I am doing that, amazing things happen. I have let go of control more in the last four years of my life than I did for the previous 32 years. And I can tell you more good things have happened to me in the last four years of my life when I've stopped trying to control things than they ever did before. But that is because I show up every day when I pray and I meditate and I nurture that spiritual practice. It leads perfectly into lesson 27, let go and let God. This is another saying that I was taught in recovery. I tell you, there's so many good ones. And this is something that I practice on a daily basis. What it really means to me today is that if God truly is in everything, like I said, when I'm going through a difficult season or if something doesn't work out the way that I'd hoped it to, I have complete faith that it's for the right reason. And sometimes we don't always get to see what this reason is in the moment. In fact, most times we won't. It's the beauty of hindsight that really gives us perspective on these things. But all I need to do to have this proof, this evidence for myself in my own life is just to look at the last few years. I'll give you an example. 2021 was honestly one of the hardest seasons of my life. I separated from my husband at the beginning of the year. Then I moved back to Melbourne. I was in a lockdown living in an apartment by myself and I'd never lived alone. Then I ended up in a really toxic situationship with somebody who has been in and out of my life for years. And oh my goodness, like I just, I didn't think I could experience any more pain. Like I can still feel it come into my body now when I talk about it. I didn't think that I could experience any more pain than I was in at the beginning of the year. And it still managed to get worse. I truly thought in that season that my feelings were going to kill me. Like that's how painful it was. And again, I'm so grateful to be in recovery, to have the support, the women that surrounded me, the incredible conversations that I had with my dad, who is like a confidant, someone that I can talk to about anything that really helped to guide me. But I remember thinking in that time, like, this is so shit. You know, I'm two years sober and my life is just, (laughs) it was so painful. And now I'm looking back on it another two years down the track and I can see every lesson that I needed to learn in that season. But I had to let go and I had to surrender for that to actually happen because everything that happened happened for a reason, even though at the time I felt like it wasn't fair, that I didn't want these things to be happening. You know, there is a lesson in all of it. Lesson 28. You cannot pour from an empty cup. Now, I've had to look at this really quite a lot in the last 12 months since starting my own business. Now, I'm aware that I have a tendency to use work as a coping mechanism when I don't want to feel something. If I have had a disagreement with my partner or I've been triggered by something, I will actually observe myself. It's almost like I'm like up there watching myself, (laughs) kind of like walking into my office and I'll sit down and I'll just start working to avoid the feeling. So I have to be really conscious to not slip into workaholism. And one of the ways that I do this is to actually schedule self-care in my calendar because I know me, if it's not in there, it won't happen. 
particularly when you work for yourself, when you run your own business, there is always something that can be done. And particularly these days when you can work from your phone, like I don't even have to be in my office to be working. So what I do is I schedule this self-care time and I try and do it once a week, but I'll be completely honest with you all. It's probably more like once a fortnight. And what happens in this time is I treat myself, I do something like, it's not like I just say, okay, it's time to switch off, go sit on the couch and watch Netflix. It's go and treat yourself. So that might be a massage or a facial or something that allows me to actually relax, switch off, not have my phone in my hand and actually feel good. Like I'm giving myself a bit of love and a bit of nurturing. But like I said, if it if it's not scheduled, it's not going to happen. So I make sure that I'm doing things that will allow me to fill my own cup so that I can then do my job and give back to others. Lesson 29, always be kind to others. You never know what someone else is going through. I actually recently saw this on a blackboard. It was out the front of my local cafe. And I loved this because it's such a beautiful message. And it's something that I try and live by each and every day, just to be kind. There's no reason why we can't be kind. It's absolutely free. You can give it away freely and it feels really good to be kind. Also, that point of you really don't know what someone else is going through. I actually remember this feeling so vividly when I lost my brother-in-law, when he passed away. I remember being back up in Sydney and it was a couple of days afterwards, We after we'd found out. And I remember walking through a supermarket and just looking around and everyone was just, you know, seemingly getting on with their days. They were just doing their thing. And I remember thinking in that moment, hmm, it's so interesting. Like you guys have no idea what's going on for me right now. Like I, I am in so much grief. I like I, my heart has been split in two. I don't think I'd ever felt pain like it. And yet everyone else was just getting on with life because that's the reality of life, you know? And thankfully in that moment, Everybody that I interacted with that day was fine. You know, no one was overly kind, but they weren't nasty. So that was, you know, that was fine. But imagine if we could all just be a little bit kinder to everybody that you encounter on a daily basis, like the world would be a better place. Lesson 30, ask yourself these three things before you say anything. Does this need to be said? Does this need to be said by me? And does this need to be said by me now. So I first heard this from my dad. I remember him sharing it one day when we were in conversation, but it's actually a quote by a British comedian called Craig Ferguson. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? But I think it's so often we can be quick to give our opinion on things, especially if we're feeling defensive or maybe unheard or unseen. But let me tell you, there is so much peace in not needing to say anything. Lesson 31, you have to do the work. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but no one is coming to save you. If you want to do the work, if you want to see expansion and growth and you want to be the best version of yourself, then you need to start showing up for yourself. This started for me when I went to rehab. It was really that first step into doing the inner work. And from there, that's when the hard work really began is actually when I came back out and I did the things. I started seeing a therapist regularly. I cleaned up my lifestyle. You know, I started treating my body with the respect that it deserved to be treated with. And I started living in accordance with my values. You know, when it came to having a healthy relationship, manifesting a healthy relationship, I had to work on embodying all of the qualities that I was looking for in a partner. So if I wanted an honest partner, I had to live with vigorous honesty. If I wanted a partner who had integrity, I had to live from a place of integrity. And guess what? When I started doing these things, I actually attracted someone into my life who treated me the way I deserved to be treated. When it came to starting the podcast, I had to do the research. 
I had to purchase the equipment. You know, I had to, had to financially invest. I had to conceptualize the design and actually start showing up on Instagram, which was really scary at first. And then when it came to building my business, I invested in a mentor. I took direction even when it was scary. And I continue to show up for myself every single day. I'll definitely say like one of my biggest strengths is my determination and my work ethic, but I still have to make the choice to do that every single day. Lesson 32, indecision is a decision. So (laughs) this is a big one. I, I don't know about you, but I used to feel so much pressure to have it all figured out. And I thought that by a certain age, I had to have all of these boxes ticked. There were certain things in my life that I had to have. So like I had to be owning a home by 30. I had to be married. I had to have children. And here's the thing. The older I get, I think the less I know. But it's a really good thing because what I, the older I get, the more I'm open to listening and learning. Like I, I no longer think I've got it all figured out. And when I stay from this place of openness and this place of humility, I continue to learn and grow. Like if you think you've got all the answers and you've got it figured out, like I feel sorry for you because that means that you're not going to be open to learning. You're not going to be open to listening, to hearing new ideas, to questioning your thoughts. If I hadn't been willing to do any of that, I would still be where I was four and a half years ago. And like, God forbid, like I'm so grateful that I have let that go, that need to be right. Another way this has shown up for me is in my personal life. You know, I felt so much pressure to have an answer as to whether or not I want to have children. And at 36 years of age, I am less clear on that decision than I ever have been in my life. But that now is telling me that that is the decision. If I am, if, if I'm indecisive, then the answer is no. For now, that doesn't mean that I can't change my mind. I'm allowed to change my mind. We all are. That's the thing, right? But I'm letting go of the pressure of having to know the answer now. You know, I'm very blessed. I I am privileged that I had the opportunity to freeze my eggs last year. So I like from a biological standpoint, I do have that buffer and that's certainly no guarantee either. But yeah, it's just interesting. It's one of those things that I always thought I wanted. And then as I got older, I realized it's actually something that I think I had felt pressure from society to do. But now I'm getting older and I still don't have children and my partner isn't particularly desperate to have them either. It's just giving us the space and the time to actually make this a really considered decision and to weigh up what both versions of our life would look like. So Yeah, I'll keep you posted on that one, but uh, it's definitely a journey. (laughs) Lesson 33, high expectations are your problem, not theirs. Here's the thing. When I'm hurting, it's usually because I've put my expectations on another person. When somebody has caused me to feel some kind of way, Rather than me pointing the finger, I now look at myself. What have I done in this situation to elicit this feeling that I'm feeling? And nine times out of 10, it's because I've used the word should. That person should do this. Or another classic, well, I wouldn't do it that way. And guess what? At the end of the day, the way I live my life is the way I choose to live my life. And if my friends or family members or back in the day, colleagues, you know, choose to live their life a certain way. That's, that's, they can do that. That's their decision. That's their choice. What I get to choose is not how to control and manage them. It's whether or not I want to be in, in relationship with them, you know, in any capacity. So again, it's kind of like that whole idea of letting go, but letting go of high expectations and just letting people show up as they are. Stop needing to control or change people, that has been huge. Lesson 34, time does heal. (sighs) Yeah, like I said, 
the perfect example of this is what I shared about 2021 being one of the hardest seasons of my life. And in that time, I did repeat that mantra, this too shall pass, this too shall pass. But I'm going to be honest with you, at the time, it certainly didn't feel like it. Yet fast forward to today, I am the most content I have ever been in my life. And I specifically use that word content over happy because I, like I said to you, happy is so fleeting. Happy is so often related to the things that are outside of me. And what I seek today is contentment because that is inside of me and no one can take that away from me. So if you are in a difficult season right now, I want you to know that this too shall pass. And I want you to know that it's not going to be like this forever and that time does heal. Lesson 35, procrastination is just fear taking the driver's seat. So if you've listened to episode three of the podcast, you will hear me talking about my experience being a perfectionist and being in recovery from perfectionism. So as a recovering perfectionist, I totally relate to this phrase or this term, which is analysis paralysis, which is essentially a state of inaction caused by the fear of not being able to do something perfectly. I'll give you an example of when I started to step out of procrastination when I started to lean into my fear. And an example of that was starting this podcast behind the smile. I did that at the end of 2022. And I was terrified at the time because I thought it needed to be perfect, but I just had to start. If you guys are thinking about something right now that you want to do in your life and you're worried about, well, I just need to go and get that piece of paper first, or I just need to do this first, or, you know, I'll start when like tomorrow never comes just have faith, stop procrastinating and lean into it. It was the same as at the start of this year when I decided to launch my business and go all in and hired a mentor. Like that was really scary to do, to back myself. But, you know, I don't want to die wondering. I don't want to wonder what if. If I'd allowed fear of failure or what other people might think of me hold me back, then I'd be in the same position that I was at the start of the year. And I don't want to live a life like that. Like, I I don't want to die wondering. Instead, this year has been incredible for me. You know, some of the things which I want to share with you so that I can hopefully inspire you is that I landed a TEDx talk. I've run multiple sellout masterclasses. I've coached and guided my clients to achieve their goals, both one-on-one and in group containers. I've run a yoga and mindset workshop, and I've launched my first retreat, which is kicking off in 2024. If I had let fear stay in the driver's seat, none of this would have happened. And that brings me to the final lesson for today. Lesson 36, the best is yet to come. You know what? My teenage years were full of angst and my 20s were lost in a haze of addiction and people pleasing. But now in my 30s, I am finally figuring out who I am. I'm in a healthy, loving relationship and I don't need to rush it or put a label on it because I seriously don't care anymore what other people think. My business is growing and evolving every single day and I feel like I'm just getting started, which is so exciting. And my passion to remove the stigma around mental health, trauma and addiction is stronger than ever. And that's why next year I will be bringing you even more conversations on a wider scope of topics. So as we wrap up today, I want to say from the bottom of my heart, Thank you to all of you who have supported the show this year. Let's continue to normalize the conversation because when we recover loudly, no one needs suffer in silence. I want to wish you all a safe, happy holidays and a magical new year. And I'll see you next time. A big thank you for tuning in today. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so by clicking the subscribe button and leaving a review. Every review helps this podcast become more discoverable, meaning more people can hear these stories of strength and hope. Together, we will continue to remove the stigma around mental health, trauma and addiction. Remember to reach out to those you care about and I'll see you next time.